Hello, it's good to be with you again for our adult Sunday school lesson. And this will be the first of a three week preview of the entirety of the book of Numbers. So we already have a rather momentous task ahead of us in attempting to try to cover as much of that ground as we can, make sense of this book as it's positioned where it is um, in the Torah, I'm sorry, the Torah, and appreciate the overall narrative flow of this book as it's going to deposit us right at the eastern edge of the Jordan River. Um, some of the battle campaigns will have commenced at that point for the lands that will become the unintended but uh, eventual eastern allotment of the two and one half tribes of children of Israel that will also set us up for what will be the events in the very short uh, narrative space, I guess, if we're thinking about uh, the chronological sequencing of these events and how much time they actually spend um, on the eastern edge of the Jordan River before Moses is allowed to see the land and then he passes. And of course, um, the leadership and responsibilities that mainly deal with the conquest, but of course, the leadership of the nation uh, will fall primarily to Joshua as the Lord has commissioned him at that point for that purpose. And then, of course, after we get done with the book of Numbers, we're going to be jumping into the book of Joshua after our final Sunday in this quarter, which has us spending some time somewhere else in the Bible. At the moment, it escapes me. So more to uh, follow on that as we get closer to it. But we'll soon be beginning a new quarterly study that will uh, take a deeper dive into the books of Joshua, Judges, one Sunday on Ruth, and then about three Sundays in 1 Samuel. So that's what we're looking forward to, and hopefully we can cover as much of this material as possible, but do so in such a way to make it make sense and help us better understand what the overarching meta narrative is, because that's what we want to what we want to keep in center focus, so we can appreciate what the Lord is doing through all of these movements, as goes the story design of Scripture itself, maintaining a proper sense of what has come to be called biblical theology. Okay, so our passages come from the mid portion of the book of Numbers, Numbers 13, and then as you can see, some verses in Numbers 14. But rest assured, we will go back and attempt to try to cover some of that material that comes before. The Lord spoke to Moses Send men to scout out the land of Canaan. I am going to give the Israelites. Send one man who is a leader among them from each of their ancestral tribes. Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran at the Lord's command. All the men were leaders in Israel, and they reported to Moses, We went into the land where you sent us. Indeed, it is flowing with milk and honey, and here is some of its fruit. However, the people living in the land are strong, and the cities are large and fortified. We also saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amicalites are living in the land of the Negev. The Hethites, it may say Hittites in your English translation, Jebusites and Amorites live in the hill country. So the hill country, if you're looking at a map, would be situated on the immediate western edge of the Jordan. So if you think about my hand representing the Jordan, the top of this is where the the Sea of Galilee would be, and down here, the Dead Sea, and this is the eastern side, and then, of course, this is the western side. This is called the Transjordan. This is the Cisjordan area, so on this side of the Jordan River, right as you cross over it, is where the hill country um, that later on in biblical text will be called either the hill country of Judah or the hill country of Ephraim and so forth, and then after you get past those rolling hills, and move further westward toward the Mediterranean Sea, all of that plain area kind of flats, by all that mountainous area, I should say, flattens out into the plains. <clears throat> and the Canaanites live by the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people in the presence of Moses and said, let's go up now and take possession of the land because we can certainly conquer it. But the men who had gone up with him responded, we can attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report to all the Israelites about the land they had scouted. The land we passed through to explore is one, of the, is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. 
we even saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak from, uh, come from the Nephilim. To ourselves, we seemed like grasshoppers, and we must have seemed the same to them. Now to chapter 14 in the first 10 verses. When the whole community broke into loud cries, and the, uh, then the whole community broke into loud cries, and the people wept that night. All the Israelites complained about Moses and Aaron and the whole community with them. If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole assembly of the Israelite community. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who scouted out the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite community, the land we passed through and explored is an extremely good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people of the land, for we will devour them. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. While the whole community uh, threatened to stone them, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tent of meeting. If you'll join me now for a moment of prayer. Jesus, our King, Lord, we are so grateful that you have watchfully, graciously, and patiently shepherded us this week. That we have this time set aside available to be able to study your word with complete freedom. I pray for those who will hear these words, not because they are my words, but you have granted me the privilege of being able to expound upon your word and you have drawn people perhaps to this space for one reason or another and i pray that i would be of service to you i pray that the words that are said knowing that there is no possible way they could be infallible as they are coming from a broken mind that is imperfect and flawed but as much as they can be i pray that they would be edifying to your body and more importantly glorifying to you I pray that as you have given me this sacred responsibility of teaching your people, help me be humble of heart and mind and recognize that my opinion is in no way, shape, or form equal to what your word says, and that I, along with everyone else out there, are at equal disadvantage and not being able to just approach your word and understand with ease and simplicity what lies before us, considering that we were not the people that you written or had these words composed for originally. They are not even in the original languages that they were once composed in. And that there are mannerisms, there are culturalisms, there are all manner of literary devices that are at play that we will not see and are not readily available or noticeable to us at first glance, or maybe even the 10th glance. I pray as you have blessed others with wisdom, knowledge, and discernment from which we can all benefit and guide, that you will help us to listen to those words, but also be able to discern what is wrong and what is in conflict with what seems to be the plain understanding of your word. But at the same time, help us to understand there, in many cases, are deeper levels of meaning that are just waiting to be tapped into, and that you are willing to open our eyes and minds to and show us. And this isn't for the mere sake of gathering knowledge, but it's meant to challenge us in our walk with you and to help us understand what it is that you intend to achieve through this great and grand story, which has hardly begun with respect to us as individuals, wherever we may be in our walk with you, for as long as you grant us time here on this earth. We have work to do for you. So, Lord, I pray that you would do all of this in your name. Amen. So, I want to kind of work backwards through this text just a bit, um, moving down further because we stopped at the 10th verse in chapter 14. So, if we go to the 21st verse and just look at two verses there, this is part of how the Lord responds to this. He says, yet as I live and as the whole earth is filled with the Lord's glory, 
none of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tested me these 10 times and did not obey me. And of course, he goes on to spell out for them what their fate is going to be. Um, a year for a day of the time that they have been wandering through the land. Those men of the, the 10 of the 12 who gave the negative report are going to wind up being consumed in the Lord's wrath immediately. And plague will break out amongst the people that evening. And we'll talk more about that as we get toward the end of the lesson. But I found it interesting that the Lord has drawn attention here to the idea that they have tested him these 10 times and not obeyed him. And I just want to go back and kind of recap some of those things. There's really no need to expound upon them because we've vis visited many of these opportunities um, or moments of their rebellion and their testing of the Lord. But just to kind of put it in perspective and remind ourselves of what it is that the Lord has had to put up with so patiently along the way for over a year now, as it's been that long since they have left Egypt. And it first began at the Red Sea before they really had even finished the first phase of the Exodus, which was leaving the land of Egypt behind. Though they had crossed the Sinai Peninsula, it was entirely part of Egypt at that point in time. Archaeologically speaking, it's definitive. There are many outposts um, that right now, of course, lie in ruins, but at one point were Syria, uh, I'm sorry, areas or centers uh, where uh, Egyptian soldiers have been concentrated to kind of serve as something of a buffer zone between the uh, Egyptian empire itself uh, or kingdom and, of course, the uh, peoples of the land of Canaan and other tribes um, or nomadic clans and groups such as the Amicalites, Ishmaelites, Midianites, and uh, Edomites and others um, to the north and northwest of the Egyptians and prevent them from being able to just simply invade the land by staging in the Sinai Peninsula. It was certainly advantageous militarily for the Egyptian kingdom to possess that area. And so that, of course, is part of the ground that the children of Israel had been traipsing through that led them on their trek all the way up to the western edge of the Red Sea at the site where they would eventually cross over. And so they haven't even left Egypt yet is the point I'm trying to make. And here they are at the brink of the sea. It's easy to see why they would be scared because they, of course, are completely cut off in the rear segment from being able to make any sort of retreat. And the geographic terrain and features in front of them also prevent them from being able to move anywhere. They are basically fish in a barrel at this point. So it's not surprising that they would perhaps be scared and afraid. However, Instead of crying out to the Lord to save them, they immediately begin to grumble and complain by asking this rhetorical question of Moses. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? As if to say, the sum total of what the Lord has done up until this point has just to simply bring them out here and bury them. He is not going to hold true to his promise in bringing them to this land flowing with milk and honey that Moses has spoken of as the ancestral inheritance that belongs to them that God had covenanted with Abraham to give his descendants after him for all generations. So it begins there. And then after they cross the Red Sea and seeing how they literally had to do nothing but just simply walk through the walls of water and the channel that had been created <clears throat> through the Red Sea for them to make it to the other side. No sooner after that, and they start to walk away from that area, they get to this place uh, called Marah, where they run into bitter drinking water, and they start to grumble and complain then and ask what it is they're going to drink. And of course, the Lord doesn't show signs of exasperation at this point. He patiently deals with them, but it doesn't stop there. Right after that, they start to hunger for food. Again, all their provisions, first of water and then of food, have begun to run out, but with all that had happened in Egypt, culminating in the crossing of the Red Sea and severing their connection and tie to Egypt altogether, and what the Lord had just miraculously done in providing for a more urgent need with giving them potable drinking water at Marah, now that they are hungry for food, you would think that they would have, in the wisdom of past experiences, thought through what it is they were about to say in uh, their approach to the Lord and asking that the Lord would ease the suffering that they are 
either about to begin to endure as their prov provisions perhaps are about to run out or are enduring by virtue of the fact they have run out. But instead, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And they said, if only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. So they just subsume. They are going to die, that there is no remedy for this problem whatsoever. And it's going to end in this great calamity of everybody just dying of starvation. And of course, this exaggerative speech of them being able to sit by pots of meat and eat all the bread that they wanted, <clears throat> which was certainly a grave exaggeration of the reality of the situation, no doubt. And, and they say, instead, you brought us to the wilderness to make this whole assembly just die of hunger. The Lord had delivered them from the land of the dead as, consider, as we consider what the picture of Egypt is um, in the closing portions of the story of, of Genesis, which is the Joseph story and how Moses is poetically posturing, or I should say metaphorically posturing this kingdom that Joseph is being exiled into. And eventually the children of Israel are brought there uh, as an exile, um, and then by virtue of that, later on, they are delivered out of the land and realm of the dead, and this is part of that journey in its beginning phase, but in spite of that, all they continue to see everywhere, seemingly, is death is following them like a shadow, just waiting to consume them, and the Lord is not doing anything to keep that at bay, and then it happens in the desert of sin, which is on the eastern side of the Red Sea, between the Red Sea and Mount Sinai itself. In Exodus 16, Moses tells them, once they start grumbling for food, the Lord tells them what it is he's going to do to feed this massive throng of people, num numbering in the high hundreds of thousands, probably more than a million, some estimates up to as much as two, perhaps, that he is literally going to cover the ground with bread as much as the dew covers the desert floor in the morning, and there will be enough for them to collect all they want, but they are not to store it for more than a day unless it's a Sabbath day, and if they do, it's going to breed worms, and it's going to stink. The Lord is going to show his measure of judgment upon them by virtue of the symbol of death, because that's what these kinds of bugs feed on, and of course, the idea of its putrescence is the fact that it's now past the point where it's unedible for human beings. It's not fit for consumption anymore. And it has, in a sense, died. And of course, they press that point. After the first day, many of them will gather. They don't have too little. They don't have too much. But some do not trust enough to not or forego storing the food. And the next morning, this is what they wind up finding. And Moses is angry with them happens again with respect to not taking precautions um, and storing up enough food for the Sabbath, the first, presumably the first Sabbath that they experienced the, the falling of the manna on. They go out there to try to collect some on the Sabbath, and Moses reminds them, this is not what you are to do. It's supposed to be a day of rest. In fact, you are supposed to prepare all that you will need the day before as goes cooking this food because you're not even supposed to go that far. So again, testing the Lord and refusing to fully believe that the Lord is going to indeed provide and care for them. Then later on at Rephidim, and here we have a problem again with water. And so Moses says to them, why are you testing the Lord? I'm not the one who is going to be able to give you water. And you know the Lord will provide. So why are you coming to him to put him through a trial as if to say you are trying to prove the character and consistency of the Lord? He has more than demonstrated that time and again, and he obviously is in no way obligated to prove himself to you at all in anything, certainly no more than he already has, and it should at this point have bred a natural instinct uh, instinct to trust him, but alas, it does not, and then later on at Mount Sinai with the worshiping of the golden calf, one of the most egregious moments in this 40-year journey, and the Lord tells Moses about what's going on as he is up on the mountain, the fact that they have made an image of a calf for themselves and are bowing down, worshiping it, dancing all around it. Then later at Kibroth Hatava, and the people began to complain openly about hardship. And when the Lord heard this, his anger burned. Fire from the Lord blazed among them, consumed the outskirts of the camp. People cry out to the Lord and the fire dies down. That name, the name of the place became Tebarah because the Lord's fire had blazed among them. That word itself meaning 
blazed. So the idea of them complaining about hardship, and of course, this is much later on in the story. It's almost toward the end. I'm sorry. It's not much later on in the story in the sense that I, I was about to say at the end of the 40 years of wondering that that's entirely false. Uh, it is later on in the story after the one year of uh, respite and being camped up around the base of Sinai, but they have left Sinai now and they have begun the journey for them to get to where our story picked up with them on the southeastern edge of the land of Canaan across the deserts of the Negev in the wilderness of Paran, which is where they are staging at to begin to make the initial assault, or so we would presume that to be the case had they all uh, given a positive report as goes the 12 spies, and then from there, perhaps, begun the immediate stages, or I should say, begun the opening stages of the conquest immediately. And then this ninth time at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran, so some of the riffraff or mixed multitude among them had a strong craving for other food, getting tired of the manna and wanting different varieties of meat and so forth. And they cry out to the Lord, weeping at the entrance of their tents. The Lord was angry because they do not want his provisions any longer. They want something different. Moses also was provoked at this. And so all this to simply say, we have several examples here, and perhaps uh, considering what's going on in the opening text of what we read in Numbers with respect to them outright rejecting the exodus in and of itself, because that is exactly what this choice is here in Numbers 14. When they hear the report of the 10 spies who say this, this is an insurmountable task and this is not something that we can do. Not that it is an insurmountable task. People like us really shouldn't be able to go against these people and defeat them. We are sorely uh, underarmed for such a thing. Um, outgunned, if you will, perhaps might be an easier way of understanding that, as there would really be no sense of them leaving Egypt with weapons in hand. We have no mention of such. I'm not saying it's impossible. Perhaps some men amongst them had weapons. Uh, we would definitely seem to read that into the story of Joshua battling the Amicalites and leading the Israelites against them, which has already happened. However, that being said, and they may have had a chance to even spoil some of those dead soldiers on the battlefield and now have more weapons that they did. But there are definitely people living in the land of Canaan who have, as we will find out in the book of Judges, iron chariots, um, even around the southern portions where they're about to go in in the area that later on, a whole generation later, Judah will wind up inheriting. And so it's a formidable task. And if left to conventional means and wisdom, there would be no reason to think that these people would win. It's not betting on an underdog. It's betting on a certified loser um, for all intent and purpose. But that aside, as Caleb and Joshua astutely recognize, the Lord has stripped them of their protection. He is handing them over into our hands if we will be faithful and obey and go in. The Lord is pleased with us, or at least he was up until this point, and if he remains pleased with us by virtue of our willingness to comply and be obedient, he is going to give us this land. Doesn't mean it won't be costly in some ways, but he will give us this land and use us to oust them, to destroy them completely. But that's not enough for them. It's not that they simply are, well, let's, let's talk this out a little longer and maybe strategize this a bit better. I mean, how can we maximize our chances of success and absolutely minimize our chances of loss? Uh, maybe even down to just a handful of people. What can we do to be uh, in every way successful here? No, they just outright reject the whole idea and the agenda of the Exodus in and of itself, electing to stone Moses and put a new leader over them who will have the single-minded purpose in uh, wanting to take them back to Egypt and that be the end of the goal and willingly subject themselves back into slavery again. Perhaps a new Pharaoh is on the throne at this point. And can you imagine what would have happened had they came waltzing back in? And no doubt there would have been scout reports that would have made their way to the palace of Pharaoh long before the Israelites had ever made it to the palace themselves to say they are coming back in great numbers, but they are not armed. They in no way seem to be hostile and uh, are non-threatening and maybe even had at this point been met by Egyptians in the wilderness or wherever who have asked them what is the intent of them returning and they want word sent back to Pharaoh that they are willing to for the first time in human history probably be an entire nation an ethnic group who are willing to throw themselves 
back into the slavery that they were rescued from. How absurd. But this is what they want. They want to outright reject the, the uh, exodus in and of itself and what the Lord intends to accomplish through this. Um, the tenth time of their testing. So before we get to that, though, we start talking about the uh, further implications and, of course, ultimate consequences that come from this. Let's consider here how the story is being put together. And so I titled this looking at it from the perspective of the sports analogy of football. And I've kind of used this concept before, but nonetheless, when the offense who is possessive of the ball at this point is wanting to score before every play, they don't have to do this, but usually it gives them just a few seconds to try to communicate effectively what has been called from the sideline from the coaching staff, head coach, offensive coordinator, and so forth, that has sent the play in to say, this is exactly what we want done. And hopefully if it's a success, the ball will have moved several yards, or maybe we'll even be lucky enough to score a touchdown, <clears throat> which increases the odds of them being able to win the game, of course. But with them huddling together, the quarterback taking control, instead of everybody just shouting ideas at each other as to who thinks this would be a better play than that one. It's just simply to relay information through the leader who is appointed over them to tell them decisively what to do. And everybody is expected to execute their assignments. They have practiced this well. Everybody in the other 10 positions not occupied by the quarterback. And of course, the quarterback being the one who is going to issue the snap count and the only one out there speaking on the field, or at least the loudest one, perhaps. Uh, and giving the right cues and signals so that the person who is going to pass the ball to him, pass underneath him, that is the center, and snap the ball to him is the term that we often use, and then begin the play. And then everybody just starts the mad scramble of going and doing exactly what they have practiced to do and can almost do, hopefully at this point, with surgical precision, blindfolded even if necessary. They've done it so much it's become second nature. That's the idea here uh, uh, in a very rudimentary way. That's what we've been looking at through the Joseph story and seeing that this is what God's ideal of his kingdom agenda looks like as he has spoken very enigmatically about how he is going to bring his kingdom rule back to bear upon humanity and not in a tyrannical and oppressive way, but in a mean by means of blessing and mercy and grace that is meant to benefit all families of the earth through the man who is childless, who God is going to supernaturally endow with children. This, of course, being Abram of Ur. And eventually, it's going to uh, come to pass where they are going to be positioned to do such a thing. But this is going to have to happen physically and generationally, which means centuries will pass before enough numbers of these people will have been able to proliferate to get to a point where they can even be considered a nation and start the process of occupying a sacred space that the Lord is setting aside for them, and then start the process of blessing the nations, which they still have no idea how that's going to happen in the Joseph story until we start to see some of that play out with these dream sequences that the Lord blesses Joseph with. And then with that, he is starting to tip his hat toward how exactly he's going to fulfill this. And in this very short diorama, over the course of Joseph's life. Granted, it takes decades to unfold, <clears throat> but in the length of time this whole story will have been running up until this point, by the time we get to this moment in the story in the book of Numbers, it's been centuries, so a short time period nonetheless. And here we see how the Lord intends to make this kingdom uh, concept work and he, with respect to a man who is his chosen servant that he will adopt as his son in the, the case of the Davidic dynasty, and ultimately it's going to result in this incarnational concept of God taking on flesh, but we haven't gotten to that point yet, right? And so all we've heard is just mention of a land and a people with kings coming from Abraham who will be set over them and many nations that are somehow going to be attached to them, and the design is intended to culminate in one teleological purpose, and that is blessing, blessing for everybody, and in the Joseph story, it's blessing by God's man ruling over his people uh, that he is descended from and he shares blood with in this space that he has set aside for them, albeit it's not Canaan, 
temporarily now it's Egypt, but God has given his sanction, his blessing for this um, at the end of Jacob's ark. Not end in the sense that he's dead, but end in the sense that Jacob is now leaving the land of Israel. And at Beersheba, God meets him and says, it's okay for you to go to Egypt and be with Joseph and stay there until you die. Joseph is going to close your eyes in death, actually. And then not only ruling over his people, but even ruling over the nations in the sense that the Gentiles who occupy the land of Egypt as native Egyptians and even others from other surrounding kingdoms who are there for whatever purpose, either as slaves or as just resident aliens. And of course, through the calamity of the seven years of famine, uh, many nations around that area, um, both on the African continent and in the eastern area of the Levant and whatnot, are able to travel to that spot in the world and benefit from their massive grain storage and perhaps stay there to continue to buy grain and so forth from the Egyptians to sustain their lives. And by virtue of that, it consolidates Pharaoh's kingdom, but blesses the nations simultaneously. So both Hebrew and Gentile underneath the headship of a uh, messianic king in the person of Joseph are all being blessed in this space, but God's intent is not to keep them there. The story must progress on in such a way that God is going to draw them out of that land and bring them back to the land that God had promised to give. Abram did not want Isaac to leave, told Jacob that he would end his story in the land of Canaan, or at least that part of the ark in which Jacob would have to leave because of Esau's wrath, but he would indeed bring him back there and prosper him in the land, and these people need to get back there to pick up now that part of the story that had been left behind a few generations earlier. But now as a nation and no longer as a small clan or band of people, which was the state of the Hebrew people when they left Canaan to go to Egypt, hardly more than 70, now numbering almost a million or more. And of course are outfitted and equipped with the Lord's resources to be able to execute the purging of the land from the vileness of the Canaanites and to set up a new garden literally a new vineyard from which God is going to bless the world from the succulent wine of the grapes of the people of Israel, not in the literal sense, but in the poetic metaphorical sense. Bless them by causing that vine to permeate outside that garden, if you will, and tentacle out over into the world. That's the idea. They've seen what it's supposed to look like in the Joseph story. They're carrying that idea with them, and now they are at Sinai. God is blessing with Torah and wisdom, though they still mess up, God is blessing them with outlines, blueprint, uh, blueprints, if you will, for a new temple garden, sacred space kind of thing that's going to be what they carry with them into the land. That's going to be God's meeting space with them, his mishkan, his tabernacle, his dwelling space, and so forth. And uh, of course, as that goes on, we'll see here in just a second how God is uh, prepared them even more with more Torah outside of what he has given Moses on Sinai. So back in Exodus 40, which we've kind of talked about briefly over the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> we remember, and I'm just setting the chronology straight here. Here's the reason why I'm rehashing this, that the Lord told them to set up the tabernacle on the first day of the first month. This would be first day of the first month of the second year that they left Egypt. The first day of the first month was the, the night the Passover actually happened. So we shouldn't presume that the very first Passover celebrated in Egypt was celebrated on the 14th day of the month. I'm not saying it couldn't have been, but it was at the time on the evening of that the Lord was telling them this will be the first of months for you. But he sets the date moving forward for being the 14th day of the first month from then on and the 15th beginning the one-week Feast of Unleavened Bread. So now they have been at Sinai for almost a year, considering the whole journey from Egypt up until this point, and God has given Moses the command to set up the tabernacle preemptively about two weeks before the Passover is going to be celebrated, the first one outside of Egypt. So we talked also about, I'm sorry, we talked also about the concept of the problem in Exodus 40 that Moses and Aaron are prohibited from entering into the tabernacle because the Lord's glory fills that space. But after all that is given to us liturgy wise in Leviticus 1 through 7, and then the ordination ceremony or the installation ceremony, the consecration ceremony of Aaron first and then his sons in Leviticus 8, 
here we come to the almost terminal end of Leviticus 9, and we are told that Moses and Aaron can now enter the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord comes down in fire falling from his presence to consume the burnt offerings that have been offered there, and the fat portions, the people fall down, they shout for joy, they worship. The space has been opened up for the tabernacle ministry or administration, if you will, to begin to function in the way that it's meant to once they carry it into the land. It's not meant to stay outside the provincial Eden space of Canaan. It's meant to go in there and become the new garden in that provincial Eden space, like the garden was in the province of Eden at the beginning of the Genesis story. And then we jump all the way over to Numbers chapter five, uh, nine. And in that, notice very little time here has passed because we have the in the first month of the second year after the departure from the land of Egypt, the Lord told Moses in the wilderness of Sinai that the Israelites are to observe the Passover at its appointed time. You must observe it at its appointed time on the 14th day of this month. So considering that in Exodus 40, the Lord said, set up the tabernacle now on the first day of the first month, that it's not until Numbers 9 that we actually get to the 14th day of the first month in which this Passover is going to be celebrated, <clears throat> before which all of these events between Exodus 40 and now of setting it up, outlining all of the different uh, offerings that are going to be given, and nothing is said of Passover because those uh, particular um, instructions had already been set in place. But of course, the consecration of the priests and putting them in so that they can actually administer uh, these particular sacraments. Sacrament, not in the sense that you and I think of in this Eucharistic fashion of bread and wine uh, and observing the Lord's Supper, obviously, just the sacrament in the sense of something sacred that's being administered and uh, going through the process, obviously, of offering um, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb and everybody else slaughtering their animals as well. So that's a lot of narrative space to cover. The events of what happens in Leviticus is at Sinai, and here in Numbers, they haven't even left Sinai yet. So moving on with that, just backtracking, though, to get us back to Numbers chapter 1, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent of meeting in the wilderness of Sinai on the first day of the second month of the second year after Israel's departure from the land of Egypt. He is told, take a census of the entire Israelite community. Now, hopefully you noticed this, but I, if you didn't, I'm just going go to go back. Numbers chapter 9, in the first month of the second year after the departure from the land of Egypt. First month, second year. Numbers chapter 1, second month of the second year. What you should notice then, if you're looking at this, and it's easy to miss because I understand there's nine chapters of space here. But this helps us understand that these events are not ordered sequentially or chronologically in this book in some cases. They are ordered as they are to help us better understand the priority of things that are being emphasized in the book over the what might be more pressing in our minds. And that would become the primacy of a chronological sequence that helps the story flow better in our minds. So perhaps the proper chronological ordering here that we are supposed to follow is what you actually are picking up with in Numbers chapter 9, because this is when they're told to celebrate the Passover. But Moses is beginning the book of Numbers by focusing on what bookends this book, and that is the taking of a census, because the events of Numbers are going to span the entire 40 years of their wilderness wandering. It begins with a census of those who are 20 years of age and older, and only of the males who would be able to fight. The number of women and children are not counted in this. That census is taken prior to them leaving, setting out for the first time from Sinai in the direction of going toward Canaan. After the 40 years of wilderness wandering, a second census is ordered along the same lines. Of course, there are less people in the second count than the first to show that the people have diminished and that is part of the consequence by virtue of what was done in the rebellion of chapter 14 in refusing to enter the land. But again, just capture that in your mind, if you will. The events of cha chapter one are taken out of the sequence as they are 
They don't come after the first month, 14th day, which is the second Passover, and the census taking place, or at least the order given on the first day of the second month of the second year. So roughly 14 days later, as they follow a lunar calendar. That would be when the census is given. Instead, that mention of that is given to us at the beginning to help us understand the broad design of the book, which is the two censuses uh, at the beginning and at the end, the beginning of the 40 year wandering and that generation coming out of Egypt and the generation that's going to go into Egypt. Following more of this, during the second year in the second month on the 20th day of the month, the cloud was lifted up above the tabernacle. So they had some time to go out, count the people, consolidate all these numbers, get an accurate count, maybe do some other things before the Lord gives the signal, which is the cloud lifting up. They tear the tabernacle down, they pack it all up, and they begin to file out in the proper sequence with the ark ahead of them all, and then the tribe of Judah. The cloud was lifted up above the tabernacle of the ark of the testimony. The Israelites traveled on from the wilderness of Sinai, moving from one place to the next until the cloud stopped in the wilderness of Paran. So they get there eventually. It makes it sound like from the moment they leave here, they go right to the wilderness of Paran. There may have been a moment or two for them to stop and camp. No mention of that is given. However, we also must understand this happens in Numbers chapter 10. In Numbers chapter 12, we have Miriam, Aram, sorry, Miriam and Aaron criticizing Moses. And when that happens, there is a time in which Miriam is expelled from the camp for seven days. And then after she is allowed entrance back into the camp, the people set out from Hazaroth and camp in the wilderness of Paran. So the events of chapter 12 with their criticism of and rebellion against Moses and the Lord and this period of her brief exile for seven days, they haven't made it to the wilderness of Paran yet. So these events, again, are out of sequence with the following of the events in Numbers chapter 10. That's okay. We just have to get used to the way this literary style is constructed. It might be something that's a little uncomfortable for us, definitely unfamiliar, but it's okay. Once we get used to seeing these things this way, it's not difficult to put things in the proper sequence that they need to be. But we should understand it's not for us to take an exacto knife, if you will, and cut those things out and then arrange them in the proper sequence in our mind. We can do that for the sake of helping it make sense so that we appreciate the chronology of events, but then we need to put them back in the jumbled order that they're in because the order that they are put in is telling the story that needs to be told the way it needs to be told, not the way that we want it told. All right. So before I get to this moment in Numbers chapter 12, I actually need to go back up here and talk about all this stuff on the right side of the screen, because I want to draw attention to the fact that the Lord has prepared them for the occupancy of the new provincial Eden. And think about that. Of all the Lord has given, and I have only just given a very brief look at the Lord's provision. And by his provision, I'm not talking about just material resources. That goes without mentioning here, because it's an easy read to see all the things that have been taken up offering wise and so forth. And of course, how the Lord is uh, meeting their specific needs as goes food and water. But I mean how the Lord has provisioned them with respect to giving them Torah. After all, we go back to the Genesis story in its beginning. And as God plants the garden and puts the man whom he made outside the garden, now in the garden, planting him, if you will, like a tree in the garden, that the Lord outfits him and the woman taken from him to complete the picture of humanity as they now are one flesh. He outfits and resources them with Torah. And of course, it's very simple. Eat of any tree you want, except that one. That's it. That's what they are supposed to abide by for now. The Lord isn't just going to leave them with that forever. He, of course, may already be walking amongst them and also instilling. We should see that he is walking amongst them. Uh, and also instilling more knowledge and wisdom. We just don't have a record of that. Either way, that's what this is drawing upon. And of course, this is a much, much deeper uh, and profound, uh, I wouldn't say exegesis, I guess, but um, exponential rendering, if you will, perhaps, of that wisdom that the Lord no doubt would have unpacked for them 
in Eden had they spent more time there and made the right choice. But I digress. But we covered a little bit last week from Leviticus 7, the law for the burnt offering, grain offering, sin offering, guilt offering, ordination offering, fellowship sacrifice that the Lord commands, and how they are to present their offerings to the Lord in the wilderness uh, of Sinai first, of course, but also after they wind up moving the tabernacle on and setting it up in the land. He has already given this liturgy to them so that they know how to approach him. That's what that sacred space is all about. He is there. His holiness fills that space as it did Sinai, and he told them, set up boundaries, barriers, so that neither you nor beast come across that without my express permission, because you cannot dwell in the presence of my holiness without uh, these grave consequences wind up happening. And of course, they are reminded of this with all that the Lord says, as goes the care of this sacred space that falls squarely on the shoulders of the Levitical priesthood. Aaron, of course, who or whoever the high priest is, being at the top of that pyramid and he bearing the most guilt of whatever iniquity transpires in that sacred space. Um, if any of those holy objects are profaned or tainted uh, in some ritualistic yet unceremonial way. Uh, so having said that, the Lord has graciously outfitted them with this knowledge to help them understand how to approach him and how to do so without fear or dread in this overwhelming way that they refuse to try to come him. I mean, remember the terrified screams and pleas of the people to Moses, please, you speak to the Lord. Don't let him speak to us anymore. If he continues to speak to us, we will die. The Lord does not want from what we gather from this, for his people to fear him so much that even though he orders how these offerings are supposed to be given, that they are too afraid to even come to him, and nobody wants to offer anything to him. He wants them to understand there is an invitation to come near his presence, but there are also limits, and there are things that have to be done before that can happen, um, and of course, he wants the contrition of their hearts and understanding they are sinners. They are not worthy of his presence amongst them, but he loves them and he wants to dwell amongst them, but that has to be taken seriously or else there will be fatal consequences. Moving on, Leviticus 11, um, and the Lord speaking to Aaron, uh, Aaron, Aaron and Mo Moses and Aaron, I'll get it right in a second, I'm sorry, of uh, the animals that they can eat, both clean and unclean, and no doubt we might recognize that there are some rules of wisdom here or principles of wisdom as to why some of these animals would be detrimental to their health to eat. And not saying that any of that should be discounted. I am saying though, that that's not primarily the reason why the Lord is giving them these things. There are the mannerisms and the, 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 sorry, the digestive cycles of these animals and various other things that need to be taken into consideration that creates a picture of death. And by virtue of that uncleanliness, ritualistic impurity that is not allowable for God's sacred space, and that may taint these people by them taking this into their body. Of course, this winds up becoming exponentially pronounced in the New Testament sense. Jesus is not kicking against this by saying that you are ritualistically unclean if you eat the animal. That's what the Lord has declared through the Levitical law itself, but they see this as being a moral sin, as if somehow you actually putting pig flesh into your body by ingesting it actually makes you a moral sinner before the Lord. And there's nothing intrinsic about the animal itself as if it contains some sort of property that will cause the person to, by virtue of eating it, somehow become impure, uh, or I should say defiled by that animal's evil, and thereby they are now considered to be equal in essence with that animal and are unfit to be in the Lord's presence or in his house. There are many other things to be said with respect to this, but don't have time for that. Having said that, I just want to simply point out that the Lord in his gracious, graciousness and mercy has used this or given them this resource as well to help guide them uh, principally within the land. Also giving them purification laws for what will happen when a son or a daughter is born to allow the female the opportunity to rest and for her body to heal so that her husband does not approach her to then uh, inseminate and impregnate her again before her body has even had a chance to heal from being pregnant the first time around. It's, even though the cycle has kicked back in and her body is theoretically able to conceive a child again, 
but just for the sake of his burning lust and not being able to wait any longer to make her ritualistically impure so that her body can heal, but at the same time, appreciating the fact that life is in the blood, blood is leached out of her body by virtue of this process of her uh, either giving birth or, of course, there being a period of uh, menstrual impurity beyond the normal uh, cycle period for whatever reason, but after it's come to its end, how she will be purified and so forth to make her acceptable in the Lord's sight again, because this picture of death is uh, a past at this point by the offering of both burnt offering and a purification offering. Um, and just in case this was somehow uh, confusing last week, I do beg your apology, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, offer my apology and beg your forgiveness on that. I didn't mean to make things confusing. I imagine there may be other things I need to clear up, uh, although no one reached out to me with respect to that. If anybody has any questions, of course, I invite you to address them with me. I I'll be more than happy to, di to dialogue with you. That doesn't mean try to talk you down and help you see that I'm right. <laughs> I'm more than willing to admit I'm wrong on anything, that it's clearly showed to me I'm blatantly standing in the the muck and mire of the wrong position um, because I don't want to be in the wrong position. But nonetheless, I, I would hate to think that I've confused anybody and then it's not said to me in such a way that I perhaps can help clear that up. So again, just opening the invitation for dialogue through the comments that can be left in the comment blocks on Facebook. It's disabled on YouTube. Uh, or of course, you are able to email me. I left my email address and cell phone number at the end of last week's lesson. But just to remember that the Hebrew word chata, as we pointed out in last week's lesson, and I will just actually go back to that lesson briefly here to point out what I was speaking about from Leviticus 8, the idea that this sin offering and the word here used chata is also the same word that is translated as purifying the altar in the same text, literally the next verse over when the blood from the bull that's used that he is supposed to offer up is used to purify or cause to sin the altar. It cannot cause the altar to sin. So the idea is that it's meant for purification. <clears throat> so he gives them this law to help them understand how the sacred space is to be purified. And also in cases like Leviticus 12, how the individuals are to be purified and made acceptable to come into this sacred space as far as they can in proximity to him. Also, how to cleanse a person should they have some sort of serious skin disease or some article of clothing or a vessel within their home, of course, uh, may be contaminated. And once this winds up being uh, exposed for what it is, then isolated so it doesn't further contaminate other articles of clothing or objects within the house or certainly other people within the camp and becomes a, an epidemic of some sort amongst the people that they are isolated for everyone's safety and precaution. And of course, this becomes a reminder and picture of sin and its contagiousness and various other things like that, as goes ritual impurity as well, which are in, in many ways different things uh, on the scale of moral failings, blatant rebellion and disobedience versus un, unknowing or unwitting um, violation of uh, ritual purity laws and so forth. But that being said, once that's done, even though they are supposed to isolate them, there will be a time, perhaps, once that period of, of uncleanness is over, and when that winds up happening, then you get the chance to actually purify them and bring them back into your presence and reestablish fellowship and, of course, proper worship with the Lord. And as goes the idea of how to purify the sacred space, that is what the whole concept of the Day of Atonement is about. It's about expiating the sins that have been committed by the people that have not had a way of being rectified, either in a restorative manner people haven't had the chance to do something to bring restoration because it's a sin uh or a um an, an act committed out of unwillful ignorance perhaps that nobody drew anybody's attention to and by virtue of that uh was not properly identified and rectified with the proper cultic cultic um cleansing ritual and sacrificial rite and so forth that is still working to defile the sacred space because we understand the blood from the animals that are sacrificed are taken into the sacred space and there are articles of furniture including the ark and the altar within the tabernacle itself that are anointed with the blood to be purified that's the whole point behind it and of course 
the measure of these people's sins in total is taken away with the scapegoat that's led out into the wilderness to continue this process of the Lord be, uh, being welcomed in by his people and them wanting to also reside and live in his presence and amongst them. Now, I, I just want to summarize by saying the Lord has outfitted and resourced with all of this Torah and wisdom and guidance to understand how they are to conduct this liturgy and to live communally with each other when they go into the land, because that's the next stop in this agenda uh, or on this agenda is to get them to the brink of the land. And then after the Lord offers the trial by instructing Moses to send in these spies and then come out with a report for them to make the choice, what will they do? But before we get there, Numbers 14, they have we have this moment of rebellion again on the part of Miriam um, and Aaron, Moses' brother and sister. But notice here that they are criticizing him because of his marriage to a Cushite woman. And we are told it's because of her. Understand from Genesis 9, the curse spoken by Noah on Ham speaks directly to Ham's children, that being Canaan. And of course, from him comes Cush. So the idea that this woman is a Cushite and most likely probably very dark skin, either Nubian or Ethiopian, which Ethiopia is a much bigger area in this time um, than it is today, as goes the modern day country. But that being said, she is most likely a black woman. And by virtue of that, Moses marrying her and the idea that she's Cushite, not simply because of the way she looks, although I can't speak authoritatively or definitively to that because I don't have extant writings from the time contemporary to these accounts to tell us whether or not something like that would have been seen as a prejudice on the part of Aaron and Miriam. But certainly I would think a prejudice perhaps that they might hold against her is the idea that she is a Hamite descended directly from the line of Canaan through Ham, or I should say uh, descended from Ham through Canaan, and by virtue of that, marked with a curse, and therefore is not welcomed or shouldn't be welcomed theoretically in the assembly of the Lord's people. Um, and I think there's more perhaps uh, to be said for that, but to move on, that when they hear this and they begin to speak against Moses and asking, does the Lord speak only through you or does he not also speak through us? And we don't know what exactly was the circumstance that led them to make this assertive statement. But that aside, then the Lord, seeing this, appears in the cloud at the entrance to the tent. This is not the tent that Moses had made in Exodus 33. This is the tabernacle itself. And he summons the three siblings there. And when this happens, after he tells them how and he, he chooses and whom he might choose to speak to, and that right reserves so, is reserved solely by the Lord. Yet with Moses, he does not speak to them as he will another prophet. He speaks to him face to face, and by virtue of that, because of Moses' stewardship within the house, that he and his status as servant is somebody that they should be highly afraid to speak against and to criticize in the manner that they have. And the Lord's anger burns against them he leaves them, and then Miriam, of course, is struck with leprosy, which most scholars would seem to agree that she, perhaps by virtue of this, was the lead instigator behind it as an older sibling, maybe uh, even older than Aaron, perhaps. Either way, though, older than Moses, and by virtue of that, um, which I suppose that is in some way irrelevant um, to what would have made her the instigator, but no doubt. It has nothing to do with the idea that the Lord is in some way misogynist because he has allowed her to be the very first prophetess ever mentioned in scripture. And she is the one who leads the people of Israel in singing the very first psalm that is even recorded. She was accorded the opportunity to be able to arrange for Moses to be able to continue to be nursed and cared for, and maybe even in some ways educationally influenced by his mother, while also. Um, being affiliated with Pharaoh's daughter until such a time that he's weaned and taken to Pharaoh's daughter's house. And so she has a very pivotal role to play in all of this. And so the Lord has been gracious toward her in a very, very key way. Um, but perhaps if she was the one who was instigating Aaron to say these things, 
then it would stand a reason why the Lord would single her out as being the one who was punished by striking her with leprosy. Nevertheless, she's uh, set aside for seven days, and then after that, they move out. But moving on with that, I, I also want to draw attention to what's going on in Numbers 13 <clears throat> with respect to the idea that this is what the report was given by the men, that we can't attack the people because they are stronger than we are. So they gave a negative report. Um, and that the land itself is one that devours its inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great size. We would seem like grasshoppers to them, the squashes. I want to draw our attention back to what the beginning of the story of Scripture is really all about in this ideal scenario of what the concourse of Genesis chapters 1 through 3 is. And that is that the Lord positions them strategically in the garden and he offers them the chance to partake of anything in the garden that they want at will, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which itself represents a source of wisdom. And as we've talked about before, and as is the case with this story, it's not that the Lord wants to withhold the knowledge of good and evil, but the Lord wants to walk them through that concourse of what is defined as good and evil according to him, and not give them the authority to decide for themselves what is good and evil, and what he sets to be as good in their minds to be considered as evil and vice versa what he considers to be evil to be called good but because they think that they are equal in authority to god to do such a thing that's the travesty and the grave nature of them partaking of this tree because in essence that is attempting to try to seize the authority from god to do this terrible thing so with that in mind that's exactly what the rest of the story from that point on even until now has continue to reiterate and recapitulate in many of these different story sequences is the idea that man is choosing for himself what is right, what is wrong, what is in essence good and evil. And so after the Lord tells them what he is free to do and what he cannot do or should not do, we see how the serpent comes in and beguiles the woman, calling into question what the Lord said, tricking them into thinking that they won't suffer the terrible punishment of dying when indeed they they would as the lord had said and they find the tree and the fruit delightful and of course it's desirable for obtaining wisdom and by virtue of that they take and they eat they do what is right what is wise in their own eyes <clears throat> they opt for a def, uh, definition of good that is more appealing to them than anything that the lord has offered up unto this particular point but now we have many instances in scripture where we have a clear delineation of what is good and evil. And this is one of those scenarios. The idea that here these people are speaking against a Cushite woman who we have no idea how exactly she has come to be a part of this great throng of people who left Egypt. We know from one of the verses we read earlier using the word riffraff, but the Hebrew word itself is meant to convey the idea of a mixed multitude that we will also see in one of these instances where a particular <clears throat> Hebrew male winds up cursing and blaspheming the name of the Lord, who was the product of a union of an Egyptian father and Israelite mother. That was not forbidden amongst the people at this point. And the woman was not told to separate from her husband and the man was not turned around and told to go back to Egypt. Many people who were not ethnic Hebrews left Egypt to follow the God of the Hebrews. And many of them, no doubt, not only simply pledged, but did whatever was required of them, perhaps even if they were males, taking on the rite of circumcision at this point to identify with being a part of this group and leaving behind whoever or whatever they were before. So assuming, and of course this is highly speculative, but that in some way this woman may be kind of operating in the same vein as Ruth to Naomi, that let your people be my people, your God be my God. That if she has pledged herself in such a way, and presumably his first wife, Zipporah, is dead, and that he wants to marry for companionship, who in the world is Moses, uh, Aaron and Miriam to say that he doesn't have a right or that he's wrong for doing this? And if anything, to begrudge this woman because she is ethnically descended from a person who earlier on in the story, no doubt, was cursed. But does that mean that all of their people are unfit for marriage? Or that their people, if they choose to bind themselves to the Lord will still not find any sense of rest, peace, or at-homeness amongst these people who now they have embraced and adopted as their own and seek to intermarry with 
and of course their own children that they spawn from uh, this union that will arise from the mate that they choose to be the legacy that they follow. That the this person like Tamar, like Bathsheba, like others as goes Gentile women in the lineage of the Lord chose to become a part of these people, uh, or in spite of their plight, were blessed by the Lord in, in some way. That aside, hopefully uh, what you're seeing here is that what is perhaps obvious enough and that they are making the egregious mistake, the grievous mistake of opting for defining what is good in their own eyes, which good to them is to kill Moses, to set a new leader over them and to go back to Egypt and submit themselves into slavery, which will be outright evil in the eyes of the Lord. So Numbers 14, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people despise me? How long will they not trust me in despite of all the signs I have performed amongst them? I will strike them with the plague, destroy them, and I will make you into a greater and mightier nation than we are. Hmm. Where have we seen this before? Back here in Exodus 32, the Lord saying, confessionally, these people are a stiff-necked people. He has seen them for what they are. He wants Moses to leave them alone so that his anger can burn against them. He can destroy them and make no, Moses into a great nation. And again, the Lord would not be wrong. We fully justified in doing so if he chose to, as Moses himself is a descendant of Abraham. But as we have over here in Exodus 32, where the Lord is <clears throat> interceded with by virtue of Moses. I was looking for the proper word, forgive me, for staring off into space for a second. He pleads to the Lord based off the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, in Israel, or Jacob, that he will make their offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky. Give your offspring all this land that I have promised. That's what he said, and they will inherit it forever. So he is pleading the very status of how God entered into a covenant relationship with these men in the first place, which was not based off any virtue or merit that they possessed. It was based entirely upon, upon, upon his sovereign grace. Grace, that's it. Unmerited favor at, at every phase and step of the journey. That he is pleading once again God's unmerited favor by virtue of the promise he made with them. So he will do again in Numbers 14. When the Lord opts to destroy them and make Moses a great nation, but he doesn't use the same words. Instead, he opts for what happened after the Exodus 32 event, which after Exodus 32, which Moses is up on the mountain. The Lord tells him to go down quickly. This is what the people have done. Before he goes down, Moses pleads with the Lord who has made the statement he wants to destroy them and start over with Moses. <clears throat> Almost like a Noah, right? Then after Moses pleads with the Lord and gains favor with him just a position of favorability per se in the idea that the lord will not destroy them in this moment moses does go down he faces the people thousands are killed and then of course judgment ensues with respect to him breaking up the idol making many of these key leaders drink the powdered dust of the gold image itself and many other things wind up happening but then Moses winds up going back up the mountain. That's the events of Exodus 34. He climbs Mount Sinai, as the Lord told him to, and the Lord comes down in the cloud, stands with him there. Moses, at this point, had asked to see the glory of the Lord, and the Lord is graciously going to oblige Moses this request. And as this happens, he passes in front of him, and he says, the Lord, um, this is his name, and the, he begins to proclaim of himself, the Lord the Lord is compassionate and a gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. That's in many ways paradoxical if we're being honest about it, because how is it exactly that the Lord will forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but then not leave the guilty unpunished and bring the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren up to a few generations afterwards? If one forgives, one would think the consequences have been expunged, that they're not being held against them anymore. 
and why will subsequent generations have to pay for the sins of the father? This has been pointed out over the centuries as a, a point of skepticism with regard to the idea of the Bible being infallible, uh, truthful in all it teaches, in, in, inerrant in all the spiritual truth that it provides, because this seems to be a completely contradictory statement, albeit it's in the same paragraph. So one would think that wouldn't be the case. Why in the world would Moses write such a thing if it would be construed as such? This is a lesson all into itself. A whole couple of hours with respect to unpacking this that I'm going to try to do so in just a manner of a few minutes. But I'm going to have to obviously summarize this and simply saying, as we were talking about last week, that the Lord does forgive. But the idea of what he is doing in forgiving, even when it comes to rebellious sin, doesn't necessarily mean the consequences do not remain. Think of the situation of David and Bathsheba. The Lord had pronounced to David that the child spawned from his illicit adulterous affair with Bathsheba would die. It would bear the brunt of his curse. Now, David had wept and he addressed himself in mourning um, uh, attire, sackcloth. He had uh, torn his robes probably. He had, made, he had obviously kept his hair disheveled. He would uh, put oil on his head. He wasn't even eating food. He had met all the signs of intense remorse as the child was born and it was sick for many days before it died and once the child died and he straightened up his servants were frightened at the idea of this and he confesses the reason why he did that is because maybe maybe the lord might change his mind and seeing how david was expressing to him what for all intent and purpose and can be reasonably presumed as intense emotive impassioned mourning and remorse over what it was that he had done, that he was indeed sincere over this, but the Lord did not relent. He pronounced punishment, he brought the consequence, and it was delivered in full measure. So the idea of what God is doing with respect to the idea of expiating or expunging sin in the Old Testament by virtue of the sacrificial cultus, and that's a fancy term, I know, but what that means is, is the cultic rites of sacrifice going in and offering these prescribed ceremonial, uh, ceremonial sacrifices for the prescribed purposes they are defined for and are supposed to be used for are able to purge sin to a point. But it's also meant in the grand scheme of the whole biblical narrative to help us better understand that it's not the ultimate definitive or declarative measure for how God is going to purge the entire cosmos of the consequence of man's sin, beginning with Adam. That will happen when God becomes incarnated in human flesh. But we are building toward that, right? We are getting toward the, uh, the precipice of that mountain slowly but surely as we work through this narrative. And so we go back now to this pleading on the behalf of Moses to the people, uh, or I mean to the Lord, uh, in Exodus 32, because Moses immediately kneels down low to the people, and he, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, to the Lord. He worships the Lord, and he says, if I have found favor with you, please go with us, even the stiff-necked people. Forgive our iniquity and our sin, and accept us as your own possession. So he is pleading that the Lord would indeed forgive. Forgive does not mean wipe out in this sense of the biblical narrative. It is not to say Look, the ledger is covered in red because of their egregious rebellion against God. And now because of his forgiveness, it's wiped away. That terminology is not even used, or I should say that those expressions are not even used of how God is going to treat the sins of his people until we get to the brink of the new covenant language offered in Jeremiah. There the Lord speaks about what he is going to do ultimately with respect to wiping away the sin of his people and he is going to remove it from them as far as the east is from the west, and he will never remember their sins again. He says that then. He is not saying that now. Nowhere in Exodus or Numbers will he say such a thing about forgetting their sin. Forgiving is allowing them to stay based off the virtue of this gracious covenant he has made with them in his presence that he is going to deal with them in their brokenness. He is going to continue to allow them to approach him in his holiness by virtue of this cultic sacrificial rite and the vicarious nature of these sacrifices that do provide atonement. But that atonement, the word 
in Hebrew itself, kefer, is meant to be understood as a covering, as if to say the thing on the inside that is uh, uncouth to the Lord, that is unholy, that is impure, that would perhaps provoke his judgment, is now covered in such a way that perhaps it cannot be seen, but that does not mean it is not there. Even though we talk about the idea of sacrificial atonement or substitutionary atonement in the Old Testament, the idea, the concept of what Jesus is going to do definitively in the New Testament is being laid down. There's no doubt about that. The foundational framework is being set in place so that it can be understood in light of all that had come before, what Jesus was going to do, falling in line with that. But speaking to the efficacy of it is a whole other thing, which, of course, uh, is part and parcel what the apostles are doing especially the writer of the letter to the hebrews uh as goes the supremacy and ultimate ultimate efficacy of his sacrifice i just simply say that to say that as moses was pleading with the lord he goes on to say these people have committed a grave sin they have made a god of gold sorry let me erase that in the highlighter they made a god of gold uh, if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, please erase me from your book. So notice this, in the substitutionary atoning way, because that's exactly what Moses said before he walked up the mountain. You have committed a grave sin before the Lord. Let me see and if I can go and make atonement. And Moses does not go up the mountain with animal in tow to make an altar and then sacrifice before the Lord. Again, I'm not saying that substitutionary atonement is not seen in any of this or the cultic system of the sacrifices in the tabernacle and later the temple. I'm just saying there are various layers to it and what the efficacy of each of these sacrifices are meant to be understood as. But here we have an even greater synopsis of the ideal, and that is a person, God's representative, offering himself in this substitutionary, propitiatory way in the place of the guilty party for him to become the victim and target of God's wrath. Please erase me from the book you have written, but notice the Lord's response. No doubt he's pleased with that, but he says, whoever has sinned against me in this blatant rebellion of idolatry, he says, I will erase them from my book. Go, lead the people. You will see my angel go before you. On the day I settle accounts, I will hold them accountable for their sin. Now, of course, I understand that creates implications and questions, as goes the idea of, well, what are we going to be held accountable for on the day of our judgment before the Lord? Friends, if we've read the New Testament a handful of times, hopefully what we've come to understand is exactly what the writer of the letter of Hebrews is meaning for us to understand, that what in Hebrews 10.4 could never be accomplished by the blood of bulls and goats is ultimately accomplished in Christ without question, without question. Its efficacy is foolproof. It has taken care of every one of the most egregious sins in the most heinous ways we could express rebellion and treachery against the Lord. Who in the world would forgive somebody who has murdered 50 people uh, without any show or remorse of that whatsoever? No one would do that and say, no, they should be set free because they said they were sorry for their crimes. Or I would hate to think that another life is tragically wasted and ruined by holding them accountable in such a way that they have to pay with their own blood for the blood that they shed. But to think of the idea that if they were contrite before the Lord, having been called unto him, brought to Jesus by the Father, heart convicted uh, by, by the Spirit over their sins that they have committed, though they still may be accountable to humanity, as goes the crimes against other human beings they have committed, and if consigned to death or life in prison, will not be able to escape that, perhaps. However, they are square with the Lord in the sense that Jesus has taken every bit of the punishment, which is death, life for life, in the sense of the Mosaic law that is given. He has taken that death upon himself, and he has paid for that sinner's um, crimes against the Lord in his own flesh. So with respect to that, we are not looking at verses from Exodus 32 to try to answer the question of whether or not sins that uh, we may have committed since we have come to follow Christ in saving faith are going to be held accountable and to our charge. Or I should say, are going to be held to our credit, our charge uh, before him on the day of judgment. This is for 
a different time and a different people at a different portion of the story before the plan in its fullness has been brought to bear. Now, all of that to bring us back here to Numbers 14, where in the same way, Moses is pleading the Lord's grace to them when he says, may my Lord's power be magnified just as you have spoken. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. Here's that Exodus 32 language right here. I'm sorry. I got caught up in seeing that on the, the screen. And I said Exodus 32 language. <laughs> I meant to say Exodus 34 language right there. <clears throat> Forgiving iniquity and rebellion, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished. He will bring the consequences of the father's iniquity onto the children of the third and fourth generation. He says, please pardon the iniquity of this people. To pardon them does not mean that they are guiltless. That means, well, let me rephrase that. What I mean by that is, it's not to say that they did not commit the crime. It is recognizing they committed the crime, but in spite of the fact they committed the crime, the Lord is going to uh, continue to dwell amongst his people. I don't know if Moses in this is asking for the Lord to relent the proclamation that he is not going to allow them to go into the land. But instead, what the Lord has firmly stated is that he wants to destroy them. So pardoning them would be to pass that consequence away from them, off of them, so that now they are not extinguished, stuffed out, destroyed, but even so, bearing the guilt of their sin in their rebellion against the Lord, but not just simply choosing to fold them all in and starting up again with Moses. That seems to be the nature of what he's asking, because you do not have a dialogue like you have with Abraham in Genesis 18, as he is trying to talk the Lord down off of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 50 righteous, 45 or 40 righteous, 30 righteous, and so forth. He's not negotiating with the Lord to try to get them to enter into the land. Moses will do that for himself after he strikes the rock on the second time, and he is asking that the Lord would perhaps reconsider and let him into the land. And the Lord says, speak to me no more of this matter. I will not do that. Moses himself will have to bear the consequences for his own conscious rebellion. Again, this is for this part of the story, folks. Don't try to conflate this with the idea of what's going on in the New Testament. That would be a terrible mistake to make. Nonetheless, do this in keeping with the greatness of your faithful love, just as you have forgiven them from Egypt until now. He has borne with them these nine previous moments of testing and giving them mercy, even though they didn't deserve it then, they don't deserve it now anymore, probably even uh, less than, but nonetheless, asking that the Lord will be gracious. So then the Lord says, I have pardoned these people as you have requested. But he goes on to say, how long must I endure this evil community that keeps complaining about me? I've heard the Israelites' complaints that they have against me. So tell them, as long as I live, then you, I will do exactly as you say. And friends, this is the essence of what winds up coming as a consequence of sin. Another consequence of sin, of course, can be divine retributive judgment that the Lord would have been exacting amongst them had he chosen to fold them all in and destroy them right there, as he had said to Moses. or back in Exodus 32 with the golden calf incident. However, in pardoning them, he's pardoning them, but still giving them over to the consequence of their sin, which is, if this is what you want. I'm giving you over to what you're asking for, as was the case with Adam and Eve. They want a world in which they are no longer subject to God's authority and can define right and wrong for themselves. What does that world look like? You know, if they're asking that question by virtue of their action, the Lord shows them, well, this is what that world looks like outside of my presence. You don't get to come into this space anymore, and you certainly don't get to partake of the tree of life. That is where you will spend the rest of your days, and under these conditions of ground that will not yield for you the produce that it's meant to, terrible pain with respect to conceiving children, um, and a desire to be suspicious and skeptical of each other, um, and of course it's going to cause derision and divisiveness amongst you as opposed to your ability to be able to live harmoniously as one flesh. You're going to have to work at that too, much more than you would have apart from this, because you'll, as individuals, attempt to define what is right and wrong, 
good and evil and not come to agreement with respect to the other person's definition of such. Nonetheless, your corpses will fall in this wilderness, all of you who were registered in the census, uh, the entire number of you, 20 years or older, because you have complained about me. Uh, I swear that none of you will enter the land I promised, except Caleb of Jephunneh and Joshua, son of Nun. I'll bring your children, whom you said would uh, become plunder, into the land that you rejected. They will enjoy it. But as for you, your corpses will fall in this wilderness. Your children will be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the penalty of your acts of unfaithfulness until your corpses lie scattered in the wilderness. You will bear the consequences of your iniquities 40 years based on the number of the 40 days that you scouted the land, a year for each day. You will know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. I swear that I will do this to the entire evil community that has conspired against me. They will come to an end in the wilderness, and they there they will die. Now, we can also speculate. Well, what would have happened if they repented? I think you may see a brief measure of this. Do not get me wrong. I'm not saying that they repented of this in the next sequence of this act. I'm saying that when you consider the idea of repentance being a turning away from one's previous position or mindset, their mindset was to wholesale reject the exodus in and of itself, to go back to Egypt. Well, let's find out what happens once Moses tells the people the words that the Lord had spoken to them. So he reports these to these things. I'm over here in Numbers 14, 39 through 41. The people were overcome with grief. They got up early in the morning on the next day and went up to the ridge of the hill country saying, all right, let's go to the place the Lord promised. We were wrong. Now, all manner of things can be said with respect to their motives. I'm not saying their motives are fully uh, and 100% pure or sincere or that it's even bearing the measure of faith that it's supposed to and the trust of the idea we're going to act on based uh we're going to act based on what we believe and that is the lord indeed is going to give us this land as he has promised and he is going to deliver our enemies into our hands and on and on i'm not saying all of that is there but a at least furtive glance toward the direction of repentance and reversing their course is I think what we're witnessing there. And then Moses says to them, why are you going against the Lord's command? It will not succeed. Don't go. The Lord is not among you and you will be defeated by your enemies. So even if they had repented, does that mean that the Lord would have relented? If they, as in the story of David in 2 Samuel with respect to his actions with Bathsheba and the Lord had pronounced that the child will die. I think you can definitely see remorse and repentance that is sincere in faith on the part of David with everything that happens. Does the Lord relent and change his mind? No. And I'm not saying that's the case for every circumstance. I'm just saying we have good biblical grounds for making the assumption that had they repented with real remorse, the Lord may not have reversed his course of action. He said, I swear I will do this. So, with that in mind, we get through the concourse of chapter 15, and notice what is said here. If one person sins, again, using the language of Leviticus 1 through 4, unintentionally, then he is to present a female goat as a purification offering. The priest will then make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the person who acts in error, sinning unintentionally, and when he makes atonement for him, he will be forgiven. And the idea of forgiven does not, again, mean that that sin is erased in the idea that it's gone forever. It is as if you had never committed that sin. That concept is a New Testament concept. I'm not saying it does not find its foundation and basis here. It does. It's just the idea of the efficacy of what's being offered and the way that the Lord wants these people to understand that sins of high handedness are not forgiven. in the way that we might think that they are. I do not murder a human being, come before the Lord's tabernacle in sacred space, seek to offer an animal in my place after confessing that sin openly to the community and expect that they're not going to stone me. Now, it doesn't matter or it doesn't mean that they won't or I should say that they can't uh, choose to not that they can perhaps choose to show mercy. 
I'm not saying that the Lord can't choose to show mercy. It's obvious he shows mercy to David, who is a murderer in Psalm 51 with respect to him pouring out his soul in confessional repentance uh, before the Lord. I'm not saying that. And I, I'm not saying that there's no possible way this sin can never be taken into account and the Lord not forgive. I'm just simply saying there is a much grander design in place here that's uh, with deeper intricacy and detail, as goes the tabernacle and the system of sacrifices in place and what they are meant to do in conveying the idea of ritual impurity and how it's to be cleansed, how the sacred space is to be cleansed. If you go back and read the contents of Numbers or Leviticus 1 through 7 and also uh, Leviticus 16 and how these particular sacrifices in which blood is taken into the holy place and even maybe the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, that it is to anoint those sacred furniture uh, pieces for the sake of cleansing the sacred space. The sprinkling of the blood has this almost detergent-like effect with clean, uh, cleaning off the symbolic impurities of the people for their sins of rebellion against the Lord. And yes, even some sins of conscious rebellion can be taken into consideration. But the Lord does prescribe explicitly what should happen for the person who does something that is considered to be perhaps high-handed. And we'll go on to get more of that here. You are to have the same law for the person who acts in error, whether he is an Israelite or an alien who resides amongst you. But the person who acts defiantly, whether native or resident alien, blasphemes the Lord, which blaspheming the Lord is not saying something bad about the Lord in total. There are many things that are considered to be blasphemies against the Lord, all right? So we have to understand there is a much broader definition which requires lexical work on our part in looking up the various ways that the word uh, rendered in English as blasphemed is based off various words in Hebrew and the context in which that's particularly used in. Because again, we have a case in Numbers where a man actually blasphemes the Lord and is stoned to death for that. He says that person is to be cut off from his people. He will certainly be cut off because he has despised the Lord's word, broken his command, and his guilt remains on him. There's nothing there said about him being able to go and offer an expiatory, propitiatory. Expiatory in the idea that it's expunged from him. Propitiatory in the sense that it's providing atonement to cover for that so that he can commit a sin. Nobody knows what it is. He doesn't have to confess it except before the Lord. He offers a sacrifice. Nobody else is really any the wiser except for the priest who knows exactly what this particular cultic ritual is because he's offering based off the sin offering per se and the idea I've committed sin so I need to offer the sin offering. And again the sin offering is a purification offering. So it's the idea of purifying the sacred space. Not to say it can't purify the individual but it purifies the individual from ritual impurity ceremonial impurity that's based off unintentional sin all right so i know that that is kind of redressing what we talked a little bit about about last week and i will say as a caveat to that i recognize that that it too is an interpretive approach based on the part of people who have written about these things in commentaries i would offer you the writings of uh, l michael morales and who shall ascend the mountain of the lord or Baruch Levine, who I will say is a Jewish scholar, but has written a commentary on the book of Leviticus, who uh, espouses the same position, understanding that this is how it's been understood throughout the centuries of Jewish history, which is incredibly important for us to recognize and understand. You might say, well, I'm not really sure that's true, because obviously there are many things that they seem to uh, misunderstand that Jesus is having to correct in the New Testament. That being said, we're talking about how this would be understood by Jews at this particular point in time when they are observing these liturgical rites that Moses has outlined for them. How would they have understood that? And for the 1,400 years from the time Moses gives it to them until they wind up, um, or until Jesus winds up coming on the scene, how would they have understood these things to mean and how would they have practiced them? Do they understand these things in such a way as to be that Anytime I offer blood for the sacrifice uh, the, that I choose to or am, am, am compelled to give, that that blood expiates my sin, what does the Bible say? It's a very deep discussion, 
And of course, I recognize it, it might not always be in the popular majority opinion of uh, certain scholars and or theologians that have come through over the, throughout the centuries. I'm not trying to, forgive me if I've taken this approach that may give the persona that I'm being uber dogmatic about it and that there's no other way to see this as opposed to just boring you to death by constantly saying, it seems like, or it's possible this could be an interpretation and saying that two dozen times or more in the single lesson, I just take the understanding that this is what it is and continue to put it forth as such. But I recognize the possibility of it being somewhat contentious. And so I, I do not wanna put forth the idea that it has to be seen this way or else you are wrong in your interpretation of scripture but just to continue to explain it in such a way that sounds matter-of-factly because that's what I'm going with. But again, if you see this as being me in error, I, I would be more than happy to dialogue with you on this and help you come um, to a better understanding of how I've arrived at this position, but at the same time, showing deference to you with respect to what you understand this to mean and not helping you work through your error, but hoping that you will help me work through my error if I have somehow gotten this wrong because I do not want to be in the wrong any more than you do. But having said that, I will just draw this to a close by saying I, I, I didn't intend to go back to all that Leviticus stuff last week to try to prove my point, but just to simply say, hey, folks, this is brought up again in this lesson material this week, though Numbers 15 wasn't really part of our text, but it comes right on the heels of Numbers 14 and is definitely part of that sequence because this is how the Lord is dealing with their rebellion. And as he is now given what his judgment for them is going to be. And then after that, immediately after the context of Numbers 14, he jumps right into sacrificial language again. He starts talking about how they are going to honor the Sabbath and so forth and what, how they are to offer their offerings. He goes into uh, burnt offering liturgy again. And then he comes down here to this. Why is that? Why did Moses put this sequence right after this moment of rebellion? Because it's rebellion followed by judgment, and then how these people are going to rectify that, even though the Lord is not saying, now that you have done that, bring the sacrifice to me so that this can be fixed, or else, no, but he is talking about what his intended future for them is, as Numbers 15 is open with, when you enter the land, think about that, in Numbers 14, the Lord had just said he wants to destroy them all and start again with Moses, but after pardoning them, he is speaking to the promise of the future that he has already made and solidified with them. And that is, he intends to bring them into the land. And in bringing them into the land, this is what he wants them to do when they get there. But he reminds them that these particular high-handed sins will not be forgiven. They will continue to bear up underneath their guilt. And this is important for these people who think that it's possible to just act defiantly against the Lord and there will not be serious consequences and repercussions to have to experience because of that. So I could go on more, but I, I don't want to belabor the point, and I may already have, in which you stop listening. So our takeaway from this, obviously, should be that we continue to appreciate the fact that the Lord is holy. The Lord is holy, and it is entirely possible and altogether probable that we may be taking that for granted in our own choices that uh, we commit ourselves to daily and that perhaps we don't place enough emphasis, which I recognize runs perhaps a little too close for comfort against the line that we do not want to cross. And that is into the realm of legalism and the idea that we're trying to maintain our salvation in some way. Certainly not. We have freedom beyond comparison or even understanding that Paul is trying to help us understand in his writings in the New Testament as are other writers. However, however, that freedom should itself not swing the pendulum in the other direction to the extreme end of the heresy of antinomianism, which is the idea that we can do whatever we want because it's under the blood of Christ. It's been forgiven, right? Of course not. That we exist in a holy, sanctified relationship with the Lord, that his presence dwells within us as if we are a temple because we are. We are the temple of the Lord. To think about all this liturgy speak that's given toward the idea of keeping the sacred space clean uh, in the text given to us in the book of Leviticus, what does that mean for us? In some ways, it is terrifying. 
oh my goodness, to think about the, the terrible, lustful thoughts that might enter my mind or the moments of anger filled, wrathful thinking toward another person in which I do not want to be merciful because of what they have said or done to me. And I judge them in anger, which the Lord says is tantamount to murder. I am in danger of defiling the sacred space. And thankfully, thankfully, the Lord does not judge as he did in the book of Ezekiel, where the glory of the Lord left the sacred space of the temple. He does not leave us. He won't forsake us. But it doesn't mean there won't become there won't be consequences for our sins. Think about it. A man ha uh, decides to sleep with a woman outside the bonds of marriage. And his, he's either confessional with that or his wife finds out somehow, even though he may plead with genuine, sincere remorse for forgiveness. His wife reserves the right to perhaps not forgive and even end the marriage. But even if she does choose to stay in the marriage, does that mean that there won't be some consequences? Obviously, lack of trust for some time. And rightly so, because of the breach of that trust on the part of the spouse. Even though forgiveness is granted, doesn't mean the consequences do not linger. And thankfully, the consequences for the sins that were placed on Christ's shoulders that we ha uh, have committed are not going to be held against us for all eternity. But that aside, doesn't mean that there won't be consequences to bear in the here and now. So let's be consciously aware of that as we strive to, as Peter <clears throat> so poignantly and profoundly pointed out in his first letter, be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy, pulling directly from this Levitical text that we have looked at last week and have in some ways reiterated this week and the vein of and in light of this, these uh, moments of rebellion crescendoing in this rebellion in rejecting the Exodus that is Numbers 14. Thank you for listening. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would please press this upon our hearts. Give us insight and deeper understanding as only you can. And we ask this, that you would be glorified in our hearts and honored as Lord each and every day. Amen.